Whoa, what the business? My name is Josh Martin. I'm the worship leader here at Purpose Church. And welcome to Purpose Church Online. If this is your first time, we are so excited to have you. Um, this is a hashtag no snob zone, as we like to call it. So yeah, we are so glad that you're here. So sit back, get comfy, enjoy the service, unless you're driving. I don't know where you are right now. Maybe you're listening via podcast, or maybe you're just in the car with the kids or your family, or whatever, you may not be able to get to lax but we're so glad to have you i want to give a huge shout out to my pastors chad and angel for the honor to be able to speak and share with you guys this sunday morning in our relationship series they gladly reminded me that relationships are not only romantic <laughs> but they come in all shapes and forms so i'm really excited to be able to share uh in this relationship series there's actually a relationship that came to mind almost immediately it was the relationship that we have with ourselves. I feel like it's a relationship that can sometimes get overlooked or neglected, especially in our community. Uh, as believers, sometimes you know we can push off the us or the you or the self or the me, but God puts so much emphasis on you. God puts so much emphasis on loving you and caring for you uniquely and individually. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. God cares so much for you. So hopefully this morning, this will help us uh, see ourselves the way God sees us. You know, that's the plan. And I'm actually going to base today's message out of Mark 12, 28 through 31. Uh, and it reads, one of the religion scholars came up hearing the lively exchanges and question of questions and answer and seeing how sharp Jesus was in his answers. He put in his question. Which is most important of all the commandments? Jesus said, the first in importance is listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. So love the Lord God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. And here's the second, love others as well as you love yourself. Let me read that one more time. Love others as well as you love yourself. There is no other commandment that ranks with these. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this morning and this amazing service and another day to just be able to get to know you better, to get to know your heart, not only for us, but for the world around us, God, for our families, for our friendships, for our relationships, for our work lives. God, better us, make us whole, and we love you and we give you everything in Jesus name I pray everyone said amen awesome okay so I don't know about you but how many of you know somebody who loves to give good advice that they don't apply themselves 
How many of you know somebody who loves to give good advice that you never see them <laughs> embrace for themselves, like the take your own advice type of thought? Well, I know a guy and this guy is hilarious. So I go to this coffee shop pretty much every day here in Baton Rouge and it's my favorite coffee shop. The culture is amazing. The people are amazing. The coffee's amazing. The food's amazing. I love it. I'm there every day. And so there's a guy that comes in. He's an older guy in his 60s, retired. His name is Greg. Greg's motto for retirement is that you retire so you can be as crazy as you want to be. That's his, that's his jam. So Greg comes into the coffee shop every day. They have a little coffee bar around where the broistas work is which, what we call them. <clears throat> there's this little coffee bar and Greg always makes his way and it's at the back of the shop. Greg always makes his way to the back of the shop and he chills back in his chair all retired and whatnot. And his thing is he loves to jokingly terrorize the staff. So he loves to jokingly terrorize the broistas. And they have a blast and he literally is joke after joke after joke after joke after joke. It's amazing. Another one of Greg's things is Greg loves to pretend like he is one of the owners of the coffee shop. And there's only one owner of the coffee shop, but Greg loves to pretend, even to the workers, that he is one of the owners. So he's constantly giving joking advice of how they should be doing their jobs better. It's amazing. He is one of the funniest people I think I've ever met in my life. So this one particular day, I'm sitting next to Greg. There's another guy sitting next to me who actually works there and he was about to clock in. And so Greg is sitting back in his chair, you know, doing his deal, uh, running his jokes. And Greg likes to take it upon himself. I don't know if you've ever been to a coffee shop, but they take your order, they take your name. And then once they're done, they sit your drink on the coffee bar and then they yell out your name. Greg, this particular day, took it upon himself to start calling out the names of the customers after they were already being called out. So this one particular moment, a guy, uh, they put the drink on the coffee bar, they yell out the name John, Greg yells out the name John even louder. He goes, John, and just ripples through the entire coffee shop. So this clean cut professional guy comes up and he looks like he's got his life figured out. He comes up to this coffee bar next to Greg as Greg sit back doing his deal. And Greg leans over to this guy, jokingly, of course, in typical Greg fashion and goes, man, I am stretched thin trying to whip these guys into shape. They just don't listen to me. I'm just trying to make them better at their job. This is Greg talking to the clean cut professional guy. So the guy laughs. He goes, oh man. And Greg's moment finally comes True. This guy asks Greg, he goes, huh, wow, are you one of the owners? <laughs> and so I'm sitting next to Greg and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is about to go down because if you know anything about Greg, he's about to milk this moment. And in perfect Greg fashion, he goes, oh, I am one of the owners. <laughs> and so literally there is no truth in that statement. So the guy in him falling into a conversation ends up the clean cut professional guy owns like these really successful restaurants in town and they fall into a conversation about business and what it means to like like franchise tax like all kind of random stuff that greg has no idea what he's talking about but he's giving this guy advice and i am next to greg dying laughing i'm dead me and the guy and so anyway, this guy goes, it's so nice to meet you to Greg. And Greg goes, it's so nice to meet you. And the guy walks off almost as like he just sat through this professional seminar with this guy. And Greg has no idea what he's talking about. And I thought to myself after I wiped the tears of laughter from my face, I thought about my, I said, man, if that guy hadn't been successful and already applied the right and the proper advice to his own life. And he looked at the success of this coffee shop and attributed it to Greg's advice and took that and ran with that. That would have left that guy broke and broken on the inside because that was not, Greg was trying to give good advice, but he had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, and though that is a hilarious 
kind of analogy. Interestingly enough, this is what it's like when we try to give love we haven't first properly embraced for ourselves. How many of you guys out there are parents and you have a kid that has started driving, has just started driving, or you remember their first time driving? Hands up, well, if you're driving, please don't put your hands up. But if you're home, if you're on the couch, you know, show of hands if you know uh, what that experience is like. It is terrifying, it is horrific. I even remember my earlier days driving, and I'm sure my mom is still in counseling for some of it. <clears throat> but yeah, it is a terrifying experience. Why? Because they have no idea how to operate this vehicle. They have no idea what's going on. Just imagine if that first experience driving a car, they had passengers in it, they had their friends in it, they had other people's children in it. Would that be a smart decision? Of course it would not be a smart decision. That would be a horrific decision to make because they are too inexperienced and too undereducated to operate this vehicle for themselves, let alone to operate it for someone else, to operate it with someone else under the guise of their responsibility. So saying that to say love is a very similar concept. Sometimes we kind of just dive in head first, whether it's, especially, you know, the puppy love, the honeymoon phase, we just dive in head first. And that's our first inclination. It's just, oh, I just, oh, I got all this love to give. But the reality is we have to be conscious of being able to first receive love properly because love is a lot like a vehicle. And the thing is, you know, it's funny when you're learning how to drive a car, it's important to have the instructor in the car, not just because it's an adult and you can't legally drive. Of course, that's the reason. But the instructor is there not just to make you a better driver for you, but to make you a better driver because they know you're about to hop out on that road and the way you drive affects the way other people drive. And they also know that one day you won't only be driving you. One day you'll have a family. One day you'll have friends, a girl's night, whatever you got going on. And they know you're going to be responsible for other people. And the way that you drive this car well dictates the experience. It, it Not only does it dictate that, it also is preventative. It prevents the, the probability of destruction being on the other side. So, um... Anyway, I'm going to give about four points, and hopefully these four points can just get our brains going and help us better, you know, love well, it, to, to love the world around us well, to, to love our friends well, to love our families well. That's, that's so important. I think a lot of this stuff that we're talking about with, with being loved first, a lot of this starts in our homes. We have to understand the emphasis of the home life that that's where most people experience the concept of love for the first time. I heard a great quote that parents are the first voice of God that you hear. Um, and, I, and that's kind of like a loose example, but saying that to say like people typically equate the love of God, the father to a lot that we experience at home. So it's very important that we take this responsibility of loving someone else seriously. But I think as well as we love ourselves, Jesus kind of laid out pretty, pretty clearly is the basis for that. So first point, first point, if you you're not driving if you got something you want to write it down pen pad or on your phone the first point is if we give love because we are first loved then we won't give love to be loved I'm gonna say that one more time if we give love because we are first loved then we won't give love to be loved I feel like it is almost the catalyst to a lot of toxic relationships of any kind, not just romantic. I mean, there's toxic friendships, there's tox toxic business relationships. I think we can avoid a lot of that when we are not giving love. Do you know somebody who like almost fishes for compliments? You're like, oh, I'm not pretty today. Or, oh man, my shoes don't look as cool as yours. Because you know, they, they're only saying that to get something um, on the other end, on the receiving end. And love is meant to be selfless. Love is true love is meant when, once it's given, it's meant to solely be about the other person. So when we give with the return in mind, and of course, we all should have expectations and standards. Of course, that's healthy boundaries. But as once it's time to give the love, 
that needs to be about the other person. So that's why we freely give love. So it's, it's very important that we're not giving love with the expectation of there being a return on the other end. We give love freely, just like Jesus did. There was really honestly no guarantees that people would follow Jesus just because he so loved the world. God loved the world because that is who God is. God says, I am love. God is love. And so anyway, he freely gives love. And once we can freely accept that gift, we will be able to more freely give that love to other people instead of giving love and expecting there to be something on the back end. And then when our expectations aren't met and sometimes our expectations aren't even communicated well, but when our expectations are not met, then it's like rage. And then it's, you know, it can get toxic really quick. So we just got to be careful about that. So, yeah, first point, I'm going to say one more time, just in case you didn't catch it. If we give love because we are first loved, then we won't give love to be loved. First John 4, 16 through 21 says we love. I love this. We love because he first loved us. So simple. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. So it's important. I think this scripture paints really, really well. What can be avoided, the destruction or the pain or the heartache of, you know, unmet expectations or toxicity that can be avoided by first understanding where our source of love and worth and value comes from. Here's the beautiful part, because it's, it's hard to just say, oh, go out and love yourself. I mean, sometimes we look in the mirror and there are flaws and we're just like, oh, my goodness. Like, you know, it can be a wrestle, it can be a struggle. But the reality is the basis of our love, especially as believers, I think this is a, a, a benefit, one of the amazing benefits to being a believer is that the basis of our love doesn't have to just be found in and of ourselves. It can be found in how God, like 1 John 4, 16 says, we love because why? God first loved us. So that can be the basis of our love and our worth and our value for ourselves. And that's a really comforting and exciting thing to know that you don't have to just muster it all up. You actually have a source. We have a source in God and through Jesus, Jesus came and represented that for us so it's important it's it's super important that we we grab hold of that and try to start applying that to our lives yeah i think jesus is honestly the great greatest example of first embracing love before he gave love to the world jesus demonstrated the greatest act of love known to mankind but first it's actually demonstrated in the scripture we're about to touch on that in a second jesus had to first know by his father he was loved and accepted and fully embraced. So Matthew 3, 13 through 17, we're about to quickly just touch on the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, 13 through 17, Matthew 3, 13 through 17 says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was open and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son. This is important. This is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. This is before Jesus ever started his ministry. This is an important moment. It is such an important moment. And Jesus clearly had to articulate the importance of the moment to John because John was like, how can, you know, I be the one baptizing you, Jesus? You should be baptizing me. Like, what's going on? And Jesus had to to show the significance. And and there's so many when you're dealing with God, there's so much significant. There's not just one little thing that you can pull from a from a passage or from a scripture. But one of the things that I think that helps support today's message is the importance of this moment was before Jesus ever embarked on giving the world the greatest act of love known to man. He had to first be able to give that and accept that for himself. 
And he did that what? He didn't, he didn't just have to muster that up in himself and he didn't have to just grab a mirror or he didn't have to just perform his way into a no. His father was right there. He had a source. And that's the good news for us this morning is that we have a source. You don't have to do this on your own. It's so, it's so hard sometimes to take that hard, difficult, long look at ourselves long enough to figure out the things in us that can be bettered. But here's the thing, we do not have to do that on our own. We have strength that comes from a source, a love that has already accepted us amidst the flaws. Can you believe it? Jesus came amidst the hurt, amidst the pain, amidst dark circumstance. You know, it's so funny, like sometimes as believers, you know, we believe that, you know, what Jesus did, it cleansed us. And sometimes we like to, to get clean before the cleansing. It's like a strange, like psychological thing we kind of can fall off into sometimes, but we gotta be, uh, you know, we got to pay attention to what's going on in our heart, what's going on in our mind is in regards to how God views us, because that is going to be the basis of how we view ourselves and how we view ourselves is going to be the basis of how we view and treat other people. So it's a very important thing. Um, point two. Point two. The right thing in the wrong way can easily become the wrong. I'm going to say it one more time. The right thing in the wrong way can easily become the wrong thing. Proverbs 14, 12 says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. I'm going to say that one more time. There is a way that seems right, that appears to be right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Haven't we all? been there, thought we were doing the right thing. I was just trying to help. I was just trying to be of support. I was just trying to encourage. I was just trying to, but in that act, we may not have known how to do that act or that thing well, and we miscommunicated and we didn't articulate properly. And in the end, it ended to the downfall or the downward spiral of something. I mean, it's so, it's so easy to fall into that, but I think one way that we can hopefully even better some of that in our lives is to be able to learn how to love well. And if, if, I, if I'm honest, I think that's kind of what my, you know, at least what I feel like God is speaking to my heart with this message is loving well. Because I, I look at the world around us and sometimes we think that it's just, you know, a lack of love. Like, you know, the world's up in flames and there's so much going on and our in our city and our government and everything that's going on. And sometimes we can just think like, oh man, where's the love? You know, that, that old Black Eyed Peas song, like where is, we can sometimes just get caught up and think it's just a lack of love. But if I'm honest, as I, I was kind of, you know, just studying and researching for today's message, it kind of got impressed on my heart that it may not just, it may not be just a lack of love as much as it's a lack of knowing how to love well. And I think sometimes they can mirror each other and they can seem like the same thing. But I think some of our issues can be prevented when there is a way that may seem right to us in the moment. But to be honest, these moments, we don't know how to properly facilitate these moments because we are not knowledgeable maybe on how to do that thing well, how to love somebody well, how to love our kids the best that we can possibly love our kids, how we can love our spouses the, the best way we can possibly love them as a person, as an individual, just not as an ideal or in an objectified way, but in a way that is very specific and unique to that person, getting to know that person, spending time with that person. I think we'll be able to cultivate relationships to where we're able to facilitate the love that we have, that we have first received, of course, from our source, the love that we have first received, we'll be able to properly facilitate that out to the world around us better. And sometimes uh, that, that ability to be able to love well can make just that big of a difference in our relationships and in our interactions on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, yes, that's point two. Point three, point three. To be pro-God, this is a 
this is an, an, another interesting one. So pay attention to this one. To be pro-God does not mean you have to be anti-you. I'm going to say it one more time. To be pro-God does not mean you have to be anti-you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, five, yeah, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. We do that first part well. We come to church, we have all these environments, we love worship music, we love services. And we come to church and we know how to cast that care. And even in this context, care is talking about worries and fears and anxieties. And we have worship songs about that. We have uh, Christian music that's about that, Christian content, books, et cetera, that's a, that touches on these topics. So we're really good at coming and, and casting all the cares. We can. We can cast it on down, we can, we can we lay it down, we can get it out, we can sing about it, we can write about it, we can preach about it, we can talk about it all day. But it's the last half that I think we can have a bit of a rub with. The for he cares for you part. That is an important part to catch because we can even sometimes come and sing about that. We can sing, he is for you. That's a song that's really been taken off in our church lately is The Blessing, which I'm sure has been <laughs> taken off in every church. But our church is really, it's a, like a seasonal song for us right now. <clears throat> and we can sing, he is for you, he is for you. But it's one thing to say something and it's another thing to live something. It's not enough just to say it. It's not enough just to sing it. It's not enough just to preach it. It's not enough just to read it. It's not enough just to write it. We got to start living that out. We have to start applying that. So when <clears throat> when you're in moments of self-doubt, when you're in moments where you're, you know, you're looking at yourself, maybe not in the true light uh, and the beauty of how God views you as a person, you have to stop in that moment and go back to that church service or go back to that small group where you were singing, where you were listening, where you were writing and you were saying he is for me. Because once we can embrace fully that he is for us, that God is for me, then we will be able to know how to properly be for someone else. So we don't want to get it confused. We don't want to get it twisted. We don't want to put the cart before the horse. We want to get this, this point right. We want to understand that it's both and. It's not either or. That God is not saying it's you or me. No, it's us. That's what a relationship is. It's us. It's us together. God wants to do life, wait for it, with you. God wants to do it with you. I love Jesus' leadership style in the Bible, the way it was demonstrated. It wasn't just a single file line. A lot of it was Jesus locking arms with people side by side, walking through life. One of the most beautiful displays of leadership, of loving someone. So to be pro-God does not mean you have to be anti-you. Why? Because God is not anti-you. God is very pro-you. So it's almost, and I'm going to go out on a limb, it's almost anti the heart of God to be anti-yourself. Because God's heart is to be pro, to be for you. Isn't that good news that you are in this relationship with God together? He is, of course, God. He is, of course, supreme. He is, of course, good. But you know what else he is for you? That's amazing news. That's something to celebrate over. That will change the way you live. That will change the way you think. That will change the way you interact with people. I promise you. I promise you, you can tell somebody who's loved well. And I love seeing like transformation happen because you can tell when somebody goes from not living loved to living loved. And the beautiful thing about God, and then I'll be done with this point, is it, it multiplies. Jesus said he came to give life and life in all of its fullness, life and life more abundantly. That's life that leads to more life, that, need, that leads to more life, that leads to more life. And I think love does the same thing. Once you first embrace that God love and it's like, ooh, I can feel it, it multiplies. And it's love that leads to more love, that leads to more love, that leads to more love. Not just for you, but for everyone you come into contact with in your day-to-day -day life, at the mall, at the zoo, wherever you hang out, whatever you do, you know? That actually rhymed. That was pretty cool. 
I got bars from time to time. All right, let's move on to this next point. Point four, the level of worth, and this is my last point, the level of worth you, as, you ascribe to, to yourself is the level of worth you will ascribe to someone else. The level of worth you ascribe to yourself is the level of worth you will ascribe to someone else. Matthew 7 and 12 says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. We grew up hearing that that was the golden rule. To do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. There is no way in the world that we can look, our, look at ourselves through a distorted lens and expect to clearly see the God worth, the God love, and the God value on someone else's life. We have to first look at ourselves through that same exact lens. Because the basis of how we will treat, how we will view anyone else, the very basis of it starts with the lens that we are viewing ourselves through. And the Bible paints such a powerful, beautiful lens for us to view ourselves through. And that lens is God's love for us. And the Bible lays it out really clear, not only through words, but through examples, through the way Jesus lived, through the way that like we got to start paying attention to that. We, got, we, we can't just be uh, surface. We can't just be on the on the shallow end of things. We have to pay attention to the way because Jesus says, I am the what I am the way the truth. And we got to start paying attention to the way Jesus lived, the way Jesus moved, the way Jesus interacted with people, the kinds of people Jesus interacted with. I mean, come on. Some some of the types of people Jesus was, was around was a perfect example of what love is. Jesus lived such a powerful, beautiful loving life. He came to be, of course, to die for us, but he came to also be an example for 33 and a half years of what this thing is supposed to look like. So we got to grasp, grasp that. And I'm going to end with this scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Guys, it has been an honor to be able to share with you guys this morning. Please, let's go out and let's embrace this. Let's apply this to ourselves first. Go home, look in a mirror, whatever you got to do. Read the word. Sometimes the word can be such a beautiful mirror of how God views us. Let the word be our lens. When next time we sing, he is for you, believe it. Apply it. Live like that. When that little voice of doubt, when that, that insecurity flies in, believe it. Believe what God has said about you. Uh, we replace the lie with the truth. We take captive every thought, right? So we were, we're going to replace the lies with the truth. What is the truth? He is for you. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, my God. So we have to live like that. We have to believe that this morning and every day after. And I promise you, and I've seen it in my own life, I promise you, the fruit will be exceptional. We will see the change in our homes. We will see the change in our jobs. We will see the change in our communities. We will see the change in our cities. And ultimately, we will see the change that we have been longing to see in our world. I'm going to pray us out. God, I thank you yet again for another amazing day to be able to hear your word, to be able to hear from you. God, unfog our lens. Let us see how you see us clearly so we can see others how you see 
others clearly as well. So we can treat them accordingly, not perfectly, but accordingly. God, we love you. We thank you. And in a purpose worship fashion, we love you. We'll see you next week. You are dismissed. Amen. I was in line when my heart grew colder You took control and I'll never be the same I'll never be the same Who could have known that our heart's so broken It's beating alive and it's all because you're new It's all because you're new You're all I wanna know, all I wanna think of Only wanna sing your praise Can't stop loving you Control and I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. Caught in your peace, living in your purpose. Forever change, and it's all because you're new. It's all because you're new. You're all I wanna know.